Good morning and welcome to the inaugural video of See No Evil. I'm your host, John Adamson. Trust me, I'm not going to start each video like that, but this is something I've thought about doing for a little while, just a channel where you hear the ramblings of a middle-aged guy talking about current events, things from the Bible, things like that. The first is a sip of coffee. Black coffee, because if I look at this video in the future and I'm fat again, I'll be reminded that I was intermittent fasting by watching this video, if I am so bold as to watch my own videos. So uh, anyway, a middle-aged man, you know, you think about middle age, I am 52, so if that's truly middle age for me, that means I'll be 104. And that'll be my end year. That'll be my prophetic last year of my life. That'd be nice. You know, I wouldn't mind making it to 104 if I was healthy. I saw recently a video of a lady who broke the world record. You can find this on YouTube. Broke the world record for the 100 meter dash in her age category at 100. So first of all, I imagine her competition's not too, too stiff. But I, I de definitely admire this lady. I mean, first of all, she didn't need any walking device. Second, her speed of walk of cro going 100 meters was basically a, a brisk-ish walk. That was her speed. And she made the whole distance by herself. The crowd was cheering her on. It was it was pretty amazing and. I believe somebody, probably from her family, met her at the end and uh, congratulated her. It was it was a wonderful moment. So if I can make a hundred like that, that's how I would want to make a hundred. I I don't want to end up like some of the patients I see. Oh, by the way, if you happen to watch this and you don't know me, uh, I am a physical therapist by my primary vocation. I have a pastoral degree from Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And I am a father of 12 and a husband of one. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, so, what are we going to talk about today? Well, first, I mean, since, since it's my very first video, let me just lay out a little bit of my, my mindset. Or as I would call it, and as many would call it, a worldview. What is my worldview? Well, my worldview is one that is creationist. More specifically, Christian. You know, what does that mean? Let me turn off the, the uh, car for the back, you know, get the background noise out of there. Creationists believe in a God that not only started all of this, all of this matter, but is intimately involved in his creation. And so he's sovereign, he's ruler. Now, I might get to the common, the common objections to a creator God. One is the question of evil. If there is a God, why is there evil? And at some point I might get to that, but not today. With that said, if you happen to time warp and watch this from sometime in the future and you're wondering what 2020 was like, uh, let's just say it's been kind of a disastrous year in many respects. I mean, there's been, obviously, in any year there is good, but I think what predominates the news in this day and age is evil. And so here's why I named my channel See No Evil. Because I believe that for the most part, those in the news, those in uh, power in my country, the United States, uh, just the general public as a whole refuses to see the evil that's going on. And so my hope is that each video will open our eyes together to some of the things going on. You know, figures the first video I make, there's like a massive truck going by and then there's an ambulance. Hopefully that person's going to be okay. Um, but with that said, let's talk a little bit about what's going on. The major stories, obviously, are the coronavirus and, of course, the election going on. And the election is the one I'm talking about between... Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So let's talk about the coronavirus first. 
which has been raging in our country for many, many months now, uh, a little over seven or eight. And we've gone back and forth about what we should do related to this coronavirus, how to best approach it. Some have been for total shutdown of, of businesses, keeping people stuck at home so that we can try to wait it out and hopefully the virus will just go bye-bye that way. That's been one philosophy, but that has obviously caused a great deal of poverty in the world. And we've seen, we had seen astronomical jobless rates across the United States because of it. And other parts of the world were facing some of the same problems. But now the economy is starting to get back. People are getting back to work. Why? Because the average person, unlike Congress, cannot just sit at home and work at home. They have jobs they have to go out to. They have services to deliver. They have items to deliver. They have items to sell. Most people can't afford to be sitting around on their bottom collecting checks from the government, which will run out at some point. The government has not does not have an unlimited supply of money, despite the fact that they're printing more. So people need to get back to work. And of course, this has become a political football. This week, or was it this week or maybe, yeah, it was last week, the CDC came out with a report that suggested that masks are not effective. Now, why is that? Because despite the education that people receive on the use of masks, they do things that make the masks ineffective. Like one is obviously wearing them incorrectly. And studies have shown, apparently, that the type of mask you wear does impact its effectiveness. So people have been wearing these cloth masks. Well, cloth masks have porous, more porous uh, holes or larger holes in them than a medical mask. And so the clinical effectiveness of those masks have been has been called into question. Uh, the other thing is people tend to touch their face and adjust their mask and they put their hands around that area and that can spread the virus too. So masks are showing up as being clinically ineffective. And I could have told you that. And even early on, uh, Fauci, who is now the head of the CDC, in case you're watching this in the future, uh, Fauci has gone back and forth on the whole mask issue. Uh, he was saying basically he was not entirely in favor of it, and that he was totally in favor of it. Now he's, of course, with this new study, calling into question the clinical effectiveness of masks. So the bottom line is we do have to be careful, obviously. We have to be careful for those that are at highest risk, which would include our elderly, the obese, and those with 2.5 or more comorbidities. But with that said, most healthy people are going to go through this thing just fine. And we've got to get to the point where I think kind of like chickenpox used to be treated, where you just allow people to get exposed you deal with the consequences, and then everybody develops immunity. Now we've we've said, or the country has said, that we're going to slow down the spread through not uh, not by not overwhelming the hospitals by preventing people from getting it too fast. Therefore, we don't run out of ventilators. We haven't come close, and a lot of uh, places have indicated their hospitals are operating at uh, max capacity or near max capacity for their beds. But part of the problem is, and I'm in healthcare, is healthcare organizations have cut back on hours and laid off uh, people in part because of the coronavirus. And so we're not operating at full staff or staffing. So even though capacity is looked at, doesn't mean your beds are filled necessarily. It just means what your staff can handle but we've laid off a lot of staff. So we need to get back to work. Anyway, that's one big thing that's going on right now is the coronavirus. And of course, it's a political football. And of course, Donald Trump is the worst person at handling it, or so the media would have you believe. Now, the second big thing that's going on right now, of course, is the election. 
And right now, Biden's up in the polls. And he's got a fairly substantial lead in the polls, which seems to indicate he may win. The problem with that analogy or statement is that if you look at the last election, 2016, Hillary was up in the polls. And they were predicting a landslide win for Hillary Clinton. And she lost quite substantially in the Electoral College. Uh, one of the big things that's going on right now is the uh, appointment or the attempted appointment by Donald Trump after Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that famous justice, passed away. Donald Trump is trying to appoint and put into the court Amy Comey, Coney Barrett. Amy Coney Barrett. And so she's going through her confirmation hearings right now. And one of the things that the Democrats have stated is that they want to pack the courts. And this has been floated in public by numerous Democrats saying, well, okay, if Donald Trump's going to put a conservative justice in there, which will basically give the conservatives, they say, a 7-2 advantage in the Supreme Court, which is not entirely accurate because Justice Roberts has not proven himself a staunch conservative by any means. And uh, there are a couple others that could possibly flip. But supposing we have a conservative bench, they've decided that they were going to, this is a little while ago, pack the court, which means that they're going to appoint six more justices to therefore have 15 and if, if Biden wins, if Biden wins, appoint six new justices, of course, of liberal ideation. Is that the correct use of that word? Somebody check me on that. Uh, anyway, now the Democrats are trying to flip the narrative because we had two debates so far. We had a presidential debate, which Biden was asked specifically about whether he would pack the court and he dodged it, totally dodged the question. And then during the vice presidential debate, Kamala Harris was asked the very same question by Mike Pence. Would they pack the court? And she just avoided the question. And then up to even a couple days ago, Joe Biden said, I'm not going to answer the question of packing the court because if I answer that, it will become the story of this election. <laughs> yes, Joe. People want to know. It should be a story related to this election. But uh, now you're seeing this happen in the news media. You're seeing it happen amongst the Democrats. They are trying to change the narrative. And this is something that Democrats do. They'll change the means of interpreting terminology to confuse the situation and hopefully regain the narrative. It's like words, you know, get changed over time to mean something. Like the word gay used to be used to mean somebody was happy. And it still does mean that. And now it means something else. But anyway, now to the Democrats, packing the court is what Donald Trump is attempting to do. And that's bad. You see what they're doing? They're changing how the terminology is being used. And they're going to flood the news outlets, because the news, for the most part, is in the back pocket of the Democrats. They will flu flood the news market to make sure that that is the narrative, that packing the court means packing it with conservative justices who ooh, will be constitutionalists. Scary. Judges actually interpreting law to make sure it's constitutional. Amy Coney Barrett. That's all she wants to do is be a constitutional justice. And they're going to rake her over the coals because of that. Anyway, this video has gone longer than I wanted it to. I wanted to today to read you the verse of the day, which I've been doing this on Facebook and now I'm starting a YouTube channel. I've been reading the verse of the day. And the verse of the day is something I'm allowing Bible Gateway to pick for me. I like that app. So Bible Gateway picked a very well-known verse, at least to many Christians, and that is Jeremiah 29, 11. 
For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now the context, and that's always important when you're studying the Bible, is to understand the context, is Jeremiah is probably the greatest pessimistic preacher you ever wanted to meet. He had a congregation of zero by the time he was done with his ministry. And it spanned, I'm going off the top of my head, but it was around 40 or so years. It was a long time. Jeremiah is basically a story of love to the Israelites. Love in the sense that they had been very disobedient and they were they ended up being captured by the Babylonians. And Babylon took over their nation and and just basically separated the Jews. And so Jeremiah is talking about the coming Babylonian invasion and in this time of oppression that the people will face. But then the Lord says, and the reason that they're going to be captured is because they were disobedient and they were committing idolatry and they had forgotten the Lord. But the Lord promises them that, look, after a time, you will pray to me. You will, you will repent. You will reach out to me in prayer and I will hear you. And I have plans for you. And they are not to destroy you, but for good. And whenever God punishes those that are his people, it is for their good. Just as you hope that a disobedient child who is corrected will move in the right direction. And so hopefully during our time together, you've seen evil and you've opened your eyes just a little bit. Take care and God bless.